Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today we're talking about Ezekiel chapter 26 through Ezekiel chapter 29. We're going to talk about some prophecies uh, that Ezekiel has made that some are claiming prove that the scriptures have errors. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys, stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Very exciting program today. It's specifically important to us, not just because of inerrancy, but because of the gift of prophecy. Did Ezekiel miss a prophetic word? And does that question whether prophets can miss it in the Old Testament? This came up in a discussion we had uh, prior to the filming of this video. Uh, it was on air. You guys got to see that discussion. And we kind of had some disagreement. We were kind of like riffing on the fly on whether Ezekiel actually missed it or not. And the question was brought up, well, if Ezekiel missed it, doesn't that question the inerrancy and sufficiency of Scripture? So we'll be tackling both of those questions. Can Old Testament prophets miss it? Does Ezekiel display an opportunity for Old Testament prophets to miss it? And additionally, if he did miss it and he attributed this word as a word from the Lord, then doesn't that mean that the scriptures are inerrant or that are, they have an error, that they're not inerrant? Anyway, all that to say, it's going to be an exciting program where we'll be touching on all that today and giving you six different ways that you can be interpreting uh, Ezekiel chapter 26 through 29 and, and this kind of prophecy. But before we do, I want to remind you that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded. If you want to support the channel, you can do that. There are links in the description. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal or you can be a reoccurring giver on Patreon. So it's five bucks a month. You'll get access to extra content. Without further ado, the fellas. Fellas, how are you guys doing? Doing well. Yeah. Doing well over here in OKC. Uh, excited about this episode. In fact, uh, Guys, this episode ref reflects a little bit of a change in my position uh, than when we did the other episode called Authority of Prophecy. You guys can go back and look it up. It's a, I think it was a great episode. Uh, but the the issue arose about, uh, as, as Josh said, whether Ezekiel missed it in chapter 26. And I leaned toward him missing it. And uh, and I gave some reasons for that. And we'll, we'll unpack that a little more as we go. Uh, but Josh actually pushed back, gave us gave a little challenge, and I think that represents kind of what we're about here at Remnant Radio. We want to debate, but debate is a way to get to truth, and, and that is such a healthy way to debate. The wrong way to debate is just to prove you that I'm wrong and that you suck, and, uh, and that's not what we're about. We want to help you break outside of your echo chamber. So Josh, I just want to give you a personal thank you. It's the only one you're ever going to get live. The rest of the time is going to be trash talk. But um, <laughs> the rest of them are going to be you sucks. <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> For pushing me outside of my echo chamber because I actually came to Josh's side on this after a little bit of extra study. So, uh, but but that's that's a big part of what Remnant Radio is about. Miller, uh, I know we talked to you a little bit about uh, about this. I know you're kind of excited about this episode too. You want to talk a little more about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I don't know if I've made a big shift on it. I don't, I don't necessarily, my, my shift on the Old Testament prophets and whether or not they can make mistakes or not, uh, hasn't necessarily shifted. Whether, what I feel about this particular passage has been sort of an up in the air. Maybe he missed it. Maybe it didn't. Uh, and I think I, you know, even after going through all of this, I'm still in that undecided space. So, uh, I, yeah, I am excited about this episode for that reason, but I also, I love what this episode represents and what you've already discussed that we actually are pushing each other. I think I've learned more from, from having these kind of conversations forced on us because of the podcast, uh, than I have in, in many ways, uh, just from being a pastor. So it's been a lot of, yeah. uh, good pushback. Cool. Well, we're going to cool. we're gonna be touching on some relevant texts, tw uh, Ezekiel 26, 1 through 12, and Ezekiel 29, 17 through 21. Miller, if you want to start reading with us, we're actually or reading for us. We're going to have uh, the scriptures on screen for people who want to follow along. Miller, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Dope. Okay. Start in verse 1 right there. Verse 1. Okay, there you go. In the 11th year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, because Tyre said concerning Jerusalem, aha, the gate of the people is broken. It has swung open to me. I shall be replenished now that she is laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers and will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. She shall be in the midst of the sea, a place for the spreading of nets. For I have spoken, declares the Lord God, and she shall become plunder for the nations. And her daughters on the mainland shall be killed by the sword. 
Then they will know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots, and with horsemen and hosts of many soldiers. He will kill with the sword your daughters on the mainland. He will set up a siege wall against you and throw up a mound against you and raise a roof of shields against you. He will direct the shock of his battering rams against your walls, and with his axes he will break down your towers. His horses will be so many that their dust will cover you. Your walls will shake at the noise of the horsemen and wagons and chariots when he enters your gates as a man enters a city that has been bre breached. With the hoofs of the horses, he will trample all of your streets. He will kill your people with a sword, and your mighty pillars will fall to the ground. They will plunder your riches and loot your <clears throat> merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses, your stones and timber and soil. They will cast into the midst of the waters. Okay, so that's the, the first passage there. Uh, and then we also need to look at chapter 29. Give me a second to scroll there. Uh, da, 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 da. So that's Sorry. a prophecy against Tyre. Yeah, that's right. That, yeah, that's cool. I, Roundtree? Okay, I can summarize a little bit before we move to the next one if you want. Sure. Um, okay, so so why don't we do this? So so we just came out of chapter twenty six, and and what you saw is this prophecy against uh, against Tyre to the north of Jerusalem or to the north of Israel, and uh, and in verses three to four, what you see it's like their towers are coming down to the ground, their walls are coming down to the ground, and they're going to scrape the soil. It's describing the leveling of uh, of what would have been the greatest commercial trading center of their day. And so, uh, and so he's prophesying against them, and many nations are going to come against you. But then in the second section of what Miller just read, it talks about how Nebuchadnezzar specifically is going to come against you. Now, that's going to be relevant in a moment. So many nations are going to come against you and level you to the ground, and Nebuchadnezzar is specifically going to come against you. So all of that's going to be relevant. And just to kind of give you a, a, a feel for the flow of this into chapter 29 that Miller's about to read again. Uh, chapter 27, it shifts into a lament over Tyre. So it's just this, this crying out over the city of Tyre. Uh, in fact, for those of you who are into eschatology, uh, this uh, is going to be really highly or widely quoted by John in Revelation chapter 18. There are going to be strong correlations. Um, and, and John's going to be making the point that this what happened to Tyre is going to be happening to Babylon on this global scale. Uh, so that's uh, the that, that's chapter uh, twenty-seven. Josh, you got to give me uh, props for bringing eschatology into passages that aren't eschatological uh, directly. But Here you go, man. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So uh, so that's chapter twenty-seven. This lament over Tyre and uh, chapter twenty-eight begins to explain the chief reason for Tyre's downfall, and uh, it's because Tyre, the king of Tyre, exalted himself as this sort of god, and it actually begins to flow into this language. This is one of the uh, two major passages in the Old Testament that seems like it might describe uh, a fall of Satan from hell and, and or from heaven in, in great detail. And so one of these two passages, so it seems like it could be this uh, typological thing where it's describing the king of Tyre, but then sort of morphs into describing Satan. But in both cases, either way, uh, both the type and the anti-type, it, it's, uh, it's describing pride that leads to a downfall. You move into chapter 29, the, the oracle seems to shift to focus on Egypt, but then it comes back to Nebuchadnezzar, whom we saw in chapter 26. And, and, uh, and so, Miller, I'm going to let you up. read. Yeah, read chapter 29. Sure thing. Oh, okay. Can you I'm not starting see it? There with verse two. Uh, yeah, yes. I can. That's where we start. Verse two. Uh, okay. no, sorry. Sun verse one. There uh, you go. Verse one. Wait. All right. No, 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 no. Hold on. You don't need to start at, at verse one. We're just read 20, the end. 20... Verses nineteen to twenty, or sixteen to twenty-one, or something like that. Okay. Seventeen to twenty-one. Okay. Seventeen to twenty-one. Cool. Seventeen. Go up a little bit. Sorry. Gosh. It's different on my screen than it is Wait, on yours. Go all, ahead. All this Bible uh, on the gotcha. screen thing okay, is all new for us. It says, in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his army labor hard against Tyre. Every head was made bald, every shoulder was rubbed bare, yet neither he nor his army got anything from Tyre to pay for the labor that he had performed against her. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall carry off its wealth and deposit it and plunder it, and it shall be 
the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt as his payment for which he labored because they worked for me, declares the Lord God. On that day, I will cause a horn to spring up from the house of Israel, and I will open up your lips among them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. I, you know, after reading okay. it, it's like it totally makes sense why it would be easy to think that Ezekiel missed it, especially because of that okay. right there. Why? Explain more. Why is well, it just easy the very for you? Fact, um, because it seems like uh, Nebuchadnezzar definitely toiled, right? God definitely sent him there, but he didn't like completely destroy it like you're sort of expecting when you first read Ezekiel 27. And he seems like, hey, you know, because you because God had sent Nebuchadnezzar to do this, he's like, here, you know what? As a consol consolation prize, I'm going to give you Egypt. But I, I think that's just at first glance. Um, anyway, that would be my my first thought. At first glance, it looks like. Uh, okay, Miller didn't or uh, the way God said, Josh, do you agree with that? What What do you see as being the problem here? I mean, why at are first, people saying this is a first problem? First glance, it seems as if, hey, God has promised Neb Nebuchadnezzar, this is what's going to happen. Uh, it doesn't exactly happen the way it seems to happen explicitly uh, in the prior verse. But I would also have everyone who's watching just remember that so much of the prophetic literature was misinterpreted by the immediate audience of the people who heard it. I mean, think about the, the suffering servant that was prophesied, okay? Jews would study this, you know, constantly. And then when the suffering servant came, they missed it. So is it possible that uh, Ezekiel's actually giving us uh, identifiers to say, hey, this wasn't the fulfillment of exactly what I was prophesying. It does seem as if something happened and it seems similar to, but he's letting us know uh, there's a future fulfillment. So that's yep. kind of my interpretive lens of the way that I'm reading it is he's letting you know that it wasn't fulfilled when Nebuchadnezzar sacked uh, uh, Tyre, uh, but there was going to be something later that we should be looking forward to. So that's my interpretive lens when I come upon this text. That being said, it, it, it does not take a, a big stretch of the imagination for atheists and others to read chapter 26 and then run to 28 and see, look, it wasn't fulfilled. The problem is, is Ezekiel wrote both chapters within his lifespan, right? He knew that he would have either changed 26 to say something like, I thought the word of the Lord came to me, but it didn't because obviously here in 29, these events didn't take place. But he says very confidently, this was the word of God and something like this kind of took place. So mm -hmm. I think that for an atheist to go, this proves that prophecy is not a thing. I think you have to go, you realize Ezekiel wrote all of these chapters, right? Like he's not intentionally contradicting himself. There's some kind of interpretive way that we can read this text. And I think that there's probably at least six ways you could read this text uh, that we'll probably yeah. touch on in this video. <laughs> yeah. And specifically because People who don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, that the that what we have at our uh, today in the Scripture and in the original autographs of the Scripture, that uh, that there was that, that it was without error, that because God does not have any error, because God can't lie, because God can't make mistakes, His word is true. Okay, so the the word is inerrantly true. That is without error. And so those who oppose the doctrine of inerrancy, the specifically what they point to in this passage is that number one in chapter twenty six, it seems to say that uh, that Nebuchadnezzar and the nations are going to plunder uh, Tyre. But then when you get to chapter twenty nine, he says, well. Nebi, Nebuchadnezzar, since you didn't get the plunder, well, I'll just let you take some from Egypt instead because you were kind of doing my work. You are my instrument of wrath against Tyre. And so I kind of wanted to pay you back a little bit with plunder and Tyre didn't really provide that. Uh, so why don't you go over here and take some from Egypt? Uh, and so the inerrantists look at that and they're like, oh, well, if, I mean, if that's what's happening, then the Bible's full of errors, and this is one of thousands of them. Okay, the other point they'll make, besides the point about plunder, uh, which we're going to come back to in our six interpretations of this passage that uh, that all fit within the scope of uh, believing that the Bible is truly inerrant. Okay, the first is the plunder issue. The second is the issue of how destroyed did Tyre get uh, by Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And the, uh, the people who oppose us and believe the Bible is full of errors, they say, well, it seems like uh, Ezekiel prophesied it was going to be leveled to the ground. And in truth, it wasn't really leveled to the ground. In truth, it wasn't plundered. In truth, it wasn't leveled to the ground. Ezekiel missed it. God's a liar. 
And so that that's kind of how the argumentation goes from atheists. Did I miss anything, guys? No, that seems right. I mean, okay. you know what I mean when I say it seems right. Like, I mean, <laughs> I mean yes, that seems to have covered okay. all our bases. Yeah, well then, so uh, so then let's walk through a, a few of the historical interpretations. Uh, does one of you guys want to start with one or you want me to kick it, kick it off? Go for it, Michael. <laughs> yeah, <Okay. laughs> Miller says you. Okay, cool. Uh, so I, I already responded with one of them, and, and that is that some people say, well, therefore the Bible's full of errors. Right. And uh, of course, we don't believe that. And I encourage you guys to go back and watch our episodes over the inerrancy of Scripture. We've had a number of those, the reliability of Scriptures. I uh, had a great episode with James White. Uh, a, a number of, of episodes that we have on inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, but here's a second one, and this is the one that uh, kind of, I would say that in our last episode, I was probably more in this camp, and uh, and that is this: Ezekiel did miss it, okay. But since the whole story is recorded in the book of Ezekiel, it does not violate inerrancy. So, in other words, this is just another instance of human error being recorded within the scripture. And so, uh, you know, we don't look at other. Uh, other human errors reported in the scripture and say like God endorses that. We, we just say that that was an error report, reported in the scripture. And so Ezekiel missed it. He recognized he missed it. He reported the error, uh, maybe like Second Samuel chapter 7, where uh, Nathan the prophet says to David, the Lord is with you. Do all that's in your heart. In other words, go build the temple. And he speaks in the Lord's name. And then the Lord rebukes Nathan later that night in a dream and basically says the Lord is not with him. It's going to be his son Solomon that builds the house. Okay, so it, this appears to be, and we can revisit this later if we want, a missed prophecy by Nathan in the Old Testament. But since it's recorded in the canon of Scripture, that, that doesn't mean that God made a mistake or God was a liar. It simply means that the prophet missed it and we learn from his mistakes because it's recorded in God's inerrant word. And that is where I did stand on this before, but it's not where I stand anymore. Now, I, I think it's I, a I, little bit where, yeah, go ahead. I'd be Josh. curious. I pushed back a little bit on this because of the way it was recorded, right? Because in 26, it recorded it saying the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. And I, I would mm -hmm. saying that if this was, um, if this was really the word of the Lord, it would have, it w or if this wasn't the word of the Lord, if this this was uh, Ezekiel misinterpreting something, I think it would have been recorded as such. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of placing the emphasis on 29 and saying, oh, this proves that he missed it, I was saying that Ezekiel would have changed the wording of 26 to indicate that, uh, you know, I thought the Lord had said or something to that effect. Not that we have examples of this in Scripture in other places, but it would seem contradictory for in one place Ezekiel to be claiming this was a prophecy from God Almighty. And then, you know, three chapters later saying actually it wasn't. Um, I, I feel like he would have changed 26. And that's what I, I, I presented to you. It, was that what compelled you to change your position? Or did you feel well, like so, there was other interpretive things that, that caused uh, you to change your position on this? I'll push back on you, Josh, on that one, because this, the exact example that Michael gave with uh, with Nathan, that's exactly how it takes place. He it, it comes to him like he, he shares the word. And Are you about Nathan and Samuel? The, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, see, the thing is, is about that word, it never, and that's what most of what I pushed against Michael when we were on our, we actually drove to Kansas and talked about this passage quite a bit. Nathan does not explicitly say the word of the Lord came to me and I told David. It just said, David asked Nathan, and Nathan responded. He went away and came back and then said, no, the Lord has not spoken. The first account was not recorded as the word of the Lord came to Nathan, and he told David, build the house. In, okay. in fact, the first me, account Let me use is, a different example. Say again? I, I understand that, that because it doesn't say the word of the Lord came yeah. to me, but I'll give you a different well, example I think would also apply in a different way. And um, I also disagree with Josh about Second Samuel seven. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah. go ahead. Well, one disagreement at a time. Well, I think the the point is is just because uh, there's a change later doesn't require the author to have to state it with some level of or measure of doubt, because as it he's recording it how it came to him, he's not necessarily recording the after the fact uh, getting it wrong. Does that make sense? And the same yeah. thing would be true like with Jeremiah 32 and he says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and it tells him to go by that field. And then he knows after he does what the word says, like then I knew it was the Lord. Why not express that doubt on the front end? 
Why wait till the end to reveal there was doubt? Um, it, but but waiting not until required the, to do any different. I just disagree that waiting to the end to, to say that there was doubt is not the same as saying waiting to the end to say it wasn't the Lord at all. Those are two different examples. Right? Well, I would but never I tell a story. He's saying it wasn't the Lord at all. Well, I think here, he still got a revelation. The question is, is did he interpret it properly or not? Um, it doesn't yeah, mean that well, he didn't hear from God. Well, Miller, you mentioned Jeremiah 32. And, and as I was playing with this in my mind as a potential interpretation of it, uh, Jeremiah 32, where he starts out, the word of the Lord came to me. And then he says, you know, go buy a field from Hananiah, whatever, whatever. And then the events happen. And then in verse eight, I think it is, then I knew it was the word of the Lord. And, I, and so I keyed in on that. I thought, okay, the word of the Lord came to me. In our mind, we think dictation. We think, you know, blah, 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 blah. God speaks audibly from heaven in the word. But for Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to me seems to be something more like, this is what I thought God was saying. And as it turns out, I was right in verse eight. Okay, so at least I, I think that's a feasible understanding of what's happening there. And then when I came to Ezekiel, he begins his prophecy against Tyre by saying in the 11th year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, okay, well, maybe it's possible that it's like, this is what I thought God was saying. Oh, boom, chapter 29, it turns out, blah, 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 blah. And so that's kind of why I was in that camp. But I'll tell you what changed me, Josh, is just a deep reading of the chapter is it I, I, I looked up just, he doesn't just say the word of the Lord came to me. He also does say, thus says the Lord God, which does seem to be sort of an unbreakable formula of this is what God is saying. It appears in verse 26.3, 26.7, 26.15, 26.19, 27.3, 28.1, 28, 28, 28.11, and it goes on. Point being, like, this seems to be really emphatic. The word of the Lord, legit, for real. I didn't just think it came to me. I didn't just misinterpret. No, like, this word came to me, and he said these precise words. And as I started to reflect on that, in the context of a doctrine of, of inerrancy, which that my mind is already settled on that matter for a thousand other reasons, but in the context of inerrancy, I thought, you know, I don't think you can say, thus says the Lord, even once, much less repeatedly, and just be straight up wrong when you said it, even if it is corrected later in the scripture. It seems as though uh, that would endanger the doctrine of inerrancy. So, Josh, that's kind of where, and, and both of you, that's kind of where my thinking went on it. But Miller, I'm not saying you're wrong and I'm right. I'm just saying that's my thinking on it right now. Yeah, and I, I think so. we probably should do another episode on the word of the Lord came to me and even title it just like that probably because I would die on the hill that the word of the Lord came to me was not, I felt like God might be saying. I feel like that is a modern prophetic etiquette thing that we teach people in churches, but not what was taking place in Old Testament prophecy. The word of the Lord came to me. It was a prophet recording an event that was God speaking, not what they thought was God speaking. And I, and I think that that's, I think that you would have a very hard time finding a passage of scripture that would indicate otherwise. Wait, um, J Josh, except what Jeremiah 32. Or Jeremiah 32, which <laughs> no, we used I, to say like, go ahead. He then then I knew the the implication was he didn't know otherwise why say it? So in Jeremiah, when he recorded the, the the story in Jeremiah, he recorded it after it had happened. So when he's recording it, he knows to call it the word of the Lord because he has the historical okay. events that took place. He doesn't write where... it down in a diary as it's happening and then moments right. later goes and tries to buy the field. He has the after the fact to know that it's the word of the Lord. Yeah, but but you're you're presuming that he has to record it uh, after the fact as he knew it versus as he was experiencing it, recording what his experience was rather than recording what he knows to be true after the fact. Does that make sense? No, it makes yeah, sense. I, I, just, I, th I, don't I think, think it's indecisive. Take... I think that it can go either way. I do understand <laughs> right. it Miller's way, but I, I've heard you articulate that It doesn't have to. Before, I wouldn't Josh, die on the hill. I think that's... Yeah, I don't think it's so strong as die on a hill. I mean, I, in fact, take it the opposite way as you, Josh. But, um, yeah, I don't think that's die it's on a hill It's a bloody hill, guys. But, but either way, there are <laughs> many other, I mean, there are other passages that would seem to suggest that you can miss a prophecy. Now, in the Old Testament, that you can miss a prophecy and not be called a false prophet. We mentioned 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, Josh, you're making a lot of the fact that 
that Nathan didn't say, thus says the Lord. That's when right. He said, the Lord be with you. I make less of that than you did, because the point of the passage is still he missed it. Um, right. He missed it speaking in the name of the Lord. Uh, in fact, I mean, it's around verse four or five. I'm not going to take the time to turn to it right now because it's, it's a fast paced show. But um, it, it begins with what we call an adversative, the word but. But then God spoke to him and said, thus That's says right. the Lord, I'm going to do this. So the point of the passage is actually Nathan for sure did miss it. And, and the question is, what is it? Is it Nathan speaking as Joe Sixpack just hanging out with David, shooting the breeze one day, talking about what he should do? Or did Nathan miss it as a prophet of the Lord, the court prophet, who uses Yahweh's name and says, Yahweh is with you. And it's his literal job description, prophesy to the king about what you should do. I'm going to go ahead and call that prophecy and a, mic, and a and missed I'm, prophecy. I'm calling it prophecy and a missed prophecy too. But, oh, amen. We agree. But the scripture is not recording it as the word of the Lord. And I think that's where I'm making a bigger deal out of it. Right? Okay. When well, the scripture yeah, records it as the word I'm of the Lord. I'm fine with that. Yeah. I'm fine that, with that's that all then. I'm saying. I'm not saying that Nathan didn't miss it. I'm saying Nathan did miss it. But the scriptures so explicitly don't say the first time he gives that prophetic word that it was the word of the Lord. In fact, it cushions it in such a way that veils it as if, was that the word of the Lord or not? And then later we find that it's not the word of the Lord. Right. Because, but, but you would still Lord call it, so it sounds like you would still call it a prophecy that yes. is missed, but not the word of the Lord. I'm cool with that then. Yeah. And that's where no, I'm saying, I would die on this hill that that phrase, the word of the Lord came to me. We know that the prophets believed that was God actually speaking because we have it written on the back end. That, anyway, that's, right. that's my whole argument. Yeah. I guess, I guess my, my, I think the the thing that I'm having a dilemma on is I I'm not I'm not so definitive on that just because um, you're you're presuming that they're writing not necessarily their experience but rather writing the the uh, facts after the fact like they're the writing in the conclusion uh, of the experience rather than just writing the experience and that's that's where I'm going I don't know why it has to be that way but I guess what yeah. you're saying is the, the word of the Lord came to me, or thus saith the Lord. Those two phrases are meant to imply the after the fact. Yeah, you know what this would be worth this doing, was. and and we should do this anyway. It, Josh, we'll do that episode. Uh, let's let's do it soon. And uh, we just need to do a search on every reference in the Bible to the word of the Lord or the word of the Lord came to me, and kind of see how this bears out. I think it'll it'll tell us the answer. Yeah. Um, let Let's keep pressing through. Um, I I shared. Want, so we've talked about, well, maybe Ezekiel really missed it and God's a liar and his word isn't true. Okay. That's nobody hogwash. agrees with that. Right. Okay. Number two, Ezekiel missed it, but it's recorded within inerrant scripture as a lesson for us about prophecy. Okay. Josh and I are a no on that. Uh, Miller is a maybe, maybe not. Okay. Now, number three, Ezekiel just straight up didn't miss it. He actually nailed it with his prophecy. Well, how could somebody say that he nailed it with this prophecy because Tyre wasn't destroyed as conclusively as he said? And because Nebuchadnezzar didn't get the plunder and God had to send him to Egypt in order to get the plunder. How could you say that Ezekiel nailed it? Josh, why don't you give us a theory for how he might have nailed it? You, sure, you already this is, touched on this once. This is my opinion. I, I believe this is the one that's right. And there's four different ones in this category that he actually got it right. There's four different ways I think that you could you could come to the conclusion that he got it right. The one that I hold personally is that there was a partial fulfillment that took place with Nebuchadnezzar and a future fulfillment that took place with Alexander the Great. In fact, there is some language that takes place um, about the towers and I mean the walls and the towers being pulled down. Um, specifically, Alexander the Great rips down the wall of Tyre and tosses it into the ocean. Because Tyre is like, it's got part of this, uh, part of Tyre is, uh, you know, uh, a part of kind of Middle Eastern continent, if you will. Uh, but then the other, I say not the Middle East as a continent, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, then there's a there's a a, 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 a a body of water that separates this island of Tyre. So Tyre has got this mainland location and a kind of island all on its own. Well, uh, Alexander the Great knocks down this wall and tosses the stones into the sea and kind of builds like this, uh, this uh, highway, if you will, this road to get to Tyre, the the uh, 
uh, the island. I don't know why I'm having a problem with my words. Anyway, so they they cross over and they fully destroy Tyre at a later date. So I think that there's a partial fulfillment. We see this throughout um, Old Testament prophecy. Um, you see partial fulfillments taking place at a given moment and then later fulfillments taking place later. Um, I think you can look at Joel chapter 2 saying that there's a partial fulfillment that took place in Acts 2, but then you have this also blood, fire, vapor of smoke, the moons being turned to blood red, the great terrible day of the Lord. Part of it was fulfilled in Joel chapter 2, but the rest of it uh, takes place throughout the period of time we're in now until the appearing of our Lord, the eschaton. So in one single prophetic word, it was partially fulfilled on Acts 2, but it's being fulfilled until the return of the Lord Jesus. Another example would be in Isaiah, where uh, Isaiah prophesies to a king, oh, you don't want a sign? Fine, I'll give you this sign. A virgin shall conceive, right? Um, that account doesn't fully take place. That sign doesn't take place until many, many, many years later. But there was a partial fulfillment of that prophetic word to the ears of that king in that very moment. Now, again, I would say in both accounts, both in Joel and uh, the pro prophecy to, the, to this king in Isaiah that I referenced, in both of those accounts, it appears as if that prophetic word is a, is a one singular moment in time. However, the biblical authors show us that this is actually a period of time that we weren't quite seeing uh, explicitly when the prophetic word was first given. So when I read uh, uh, the partial fulfillment view, I go, Ezekiel didn't miss it. Uh, it was partially fulfilled in Nebuchadnezzar and fully fulfilled in Alexander the Great. Those are my thoughts. Yeah, uh, that's great, Josh. And I think that's a really good possibility. And I'm going to be so a little bit agnostic on which of these solutions uh, actually is the solution. And, and here's what's great, because uh, when it comes to like the response of the one who believes in inerrancy, it, it's ideal if it's not like a grasping for straws to try to make this work so I can keep believing the Bible. No, like these are actually really good solutions. Josh, what you propose is a really good solution to this potential problem. And uh, and I think here's another one. And this one was presented by Mike Winger in, uh, in one of his videos. Mike Winger has been on the show. I encourage you to go, go back and watch Mike Winger's uh, episodes that he's done with us, as well as his channel, a uh, phenomenal channel, great researcher. And, and uh, what he's going to point out is what we might call the different pronouns view and has nothing to do with like pop culture and what's happening today. But uh, <laughs> I have, way, I have you your pronouns noticed, up there, Michael, for display. I, I've always called <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar a shim. Is that not what you're supposed to do? <laughs> Jeez, bro. <laughs> he, he shimmed them. <laughs> yeah. oh. have, have you ever noticed like, I, I don't know, I'm on Twitter barely, but I am. I'm actually trying to do better about it. But um, you ever noticed how everybody who's deconstructed has pronouns in their bio. I'm like, Hmm, that's mm. kind of interesting. Okay. So, um, let's, let's go to Josh. You can, if you can make it go up a little bit, to, um, verse five. Okay. I want to show you something. Okay. So he's just finished saying in verse four, they'll destroy your walls. Oh, tire and break down your towers and scrape you to the bare rock. And then verse five, uh, she shall be in the midst of the sea. This is Tyre, a place for the spreading of nets. For I have spoken, declares the Lord God, and she shall become plunder for the nations. Now that could be important because in chapter 29, if you remember, the adjustment was Nebuchadnezzar. Hey, Nebuchadnezzar, you didn't get plunder from Tyre. Okay. That, it, but chapter 26, the original prophecy, it seems possible was actually about the nations will get plunder, that it was never intended to mean that Nebuchadnezzar himself specifically would get plunder. And so this is a possibly not a contradiction. This could be reinforced by a shift in the pronouns in the text. And that's what I do like about this view uh, as a possibility. I'm not saying it's my view. I don't know. But I do like it as a possibility because it, it seems to, rather than try to explain away a problem, to actually explain the text. Why does he use different pronouns here? And uh, and it could be just a stylistic variation. That's a possibility. But it, it seems like it could be more. Uh, so if we keep reading, I'll just pick it up in verse 10. It's He started addressing Nebuchadnezzar specifically. He's gone from addressing the nation's plundering Tyre. And then he's talking about Nebuchadnezzar being a major part of this raid. Verse 10, his, Nebuchadnezzar's. Horses will be so many that their dust will cover you. Your walls will shake at your tire. Walls will shake at the noise of the horsemen and wagons uh, and chariots. When he, when he, Nebuchadnezzar, enters your gates as a man, his men enter a city that has been breached with the hooves and horses, he will trample all your streets. He will kill your people with the sword and your mighty pillars will fall to the ground. Verse 12, they 
will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses and, and so on. And then from there on, it's they, 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 they. Okay, so could it be possible that that the plunder portion of this prophecy was directed at the nations, but not Nebuchadnezzar specifically, so that the apparent correction that comes in chapter 29, like, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, you didn't get plunder, so go over here and get it, actually was not a correction at all because Nebuchadnezzar himself was never promised this. Now, it's not conclusive because sometimes there can be a variation for stylistic reasons. Uh, it's all part of the same passage. It, it just seems to flow that maybe he's implying that Nebuchadnezzar should have gotten plunder. That's certainly a possibility, but I think a pretty strong case can be made Mike Winger's case could be made, and it is made by many scholars uh, that, you know what, this is a the Nebuchadnezzar portion of this prophecy. He was never promised that he would get plunder. And so that could be one explanation. Call it the and pronouns theory. Let me, let me push back on the pronouns theory, not just because <laughs> I'm really conservative, okay? Um, but uh, I reached out to my friends over at Kairos uh, Classrooms, uh, they they support the show. Uh, I put links in uh, the video uh, for Kairos Classroom. So if you want to learn Greek and Hebrew, it's crazy uh, inexpensive. You go check it out. There's links in the description. You go uh, check out their classes. Um, but I, I reached out to them and uh, Ryan and Courtney. Ryan does the, the Greek and Courtney does the Hebrew classes. Uh, I sent them this and said, hey, what, what do you think of this pronoun stuff? I'm not a Greek scholar. I read a couple commentaries on uh, Logos that seemed that, like this could be plausible. Mike Winger, I trust him. It says that it seems plausible. Uh, Courtney, who does the Hebrew, goes, you know, I just don't think it's a really compelling argument. I, I don't think it's there. The Greek Septuagint, the translation of the Old Testament also uh, emphasize, it kind of pulls out that pronoun and it just makes them all he uh, instead of they, like the Septuagint translators assumed that it was all for Nebuchadnezzar. Um, so all that to be said, there is debate on this on both sides. There are scholars and linguists who will differ and disagree on this. So it's worthy putting all of our research out on on the front end it's i want to hold that view frankly i just it does seem like it's a little bit harder for me it's easier for me to hold to the two different views miller talk to us about conditional prophecy do you want to give us uh, that that third view yeah sure so we see the the precedent well when you say conditional that just means like a, if you do this then this will happen if you don't do this then this will ha this will right. not happen right so there's uh, that's what we mean by conditional um uh, prophecy. So when this prophecy is made in Ezekiel against Tyre and with King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, what we don't know is, are there any conditions on this? And the author doesn't have to give us everything we want, right? So he's free to say yes or no to this. And then you, you see this happen both with uh, precedent for, for this with Jeremiah 18, with the potter and the clay, which we'll read. I'm going to read like maybe verse 5 through verse 10, if that's okay. If you can scroll have, it down a little oh yeah, bit. Yeah, there, sure, sure, sure. Right there, that's perfect. And then also, I would say you see this happening with uh, Jonah when he goes to Nineveh. There, there's no conditional phrase that's given, and yet it happens anyways. Like the Lord relents from the calamity he's going to bring upon Nineveh. So here's where Jeremiah says that then the context is Jeremiah has been told by the Lord to go over to the potter's house and watch him working with a lump of clay. He starts working with a lump of clay. The clay becomes something other than the potter desires. So the potter begins to reform the clay into something else he didn't originally intend. Um, and, and this is what God has to say about that. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I have intended to do it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I intended to do it. And so then he goes on to give a prophecy about Israel because that's exactly what's happened. They've become something other than what God has intended. And yet there's still sort of this lingering hope that if Israel repent, maybe God could once again change his mind. But that's sort of the, the point that um, when God gives a prophecy through a prophet, uh, he is free to change his mind. At the end of the day, he is the one who is sovereign. And he often does change his mind based upon the evil that people can uh, choose to do or if they repent and choose to do otherwise. And so that right. could be what's happening and, here. And when we say tired. change your mind, that's that's worth a whole other episode too because 
right. God and his sovereignty knew the end from the beginning. I just figure I'll throw that in there, but so we'll there, do another those are episode like, on Those that. are like contingent prophecies. Like, hey, Nineveh, I'm going to destroy you because you're sinful. And then Nineveh goes, okay, then let's stop being sinful, guys. Okay, great. Let's repent. It's like within the prophetic word it seems to be like this conditional... I mean, not that it's explicit, but it's certainly implicit is what it appears. Um, you know, so, well, there's so certainly going, ones where they, they are actually explicitly stated, and then there's others where it's implicit based upon the fact that God changes his mind after the fact. That's right. That's right. So so mm -hmm. this gives us an interpretation of, but the problem with this is that we don't have any explicit recording in this text of Tyre repenting, or potentially Nebuchadnezzar doing more evil uh, and then him, you know, refraining from a blessing because it seems as if he gave the blessing of Nebuchadnezzar Egypt. Uh, maybe Israel, you know, turned and did evil, and that's why he didn't cause the kind of destruction on Tyre. We're not really sure because the yeah. text doesn't explicitly say anything like that. So to me, this one feels like a bit of a more of a leap. It gives it gives a loophole for why this prophecy might not have come to pass. But there's nothing within the text that would give me that kind of loophole that I would expect. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, totally. I, I agree that's with you, my, Josh. That's my hang up with it as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I, I think the uh, the other two theories, the, the pronouns and the partial and full fulfillment uh, theory are much more compelling than this. And uh, but all three of the all three of the ones we presented as, as uh, alternative responses, including the conditional prophecy, are more compelling than this next one. Josh, you want to talk to us about the spiritual <laughs> fulfillment view? Yeah, okay, so in Ezekiel chapter 28, many people are familiar with the King of Tyre passage. Uh, verses 1 through 10 seems to be uh, specifically about a human king uh, that you know, is the King of Tyre, but then there seems to be this transition point that some theologians pick up on in verse 11 and following, where it seems to talk about the spiritual being that exists, that's kind of pulling the puppet strings, if you will, of the king of Tyre. And that spiritual being seems to be this choice cherub and, you know, it was like this great worshipful angel kind of thing. And it's got, you know, all kinds of different uh, 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 jewels and stuff inladen within his own bodies. And it seems like pipe organs are built into the guy. I mean, it's a wild passage. You go read it yourself. Uh, but the idea is that, OK, there's a king of Tyre. There's also Satan, right, who rises himself up, this prideful being who wants to be God himself and receive worship from God himself. So some will go, well, if 26 is about the destruction of Tyre, and then we see 27, 28, and then 29, we see that not being fulfilled. But smack dab in the middle, in chapter 28, we see the king of Tyre is actually Satan. Well, then there must be a spiritual fulfillment. We see a partial fulfillment in the natural uh, for the physical place tire and the physical king tire. But but maybe there's like a spiritual emphasis that takes place where God is saying, you know, there at the end of Ezekiel, uh, I forget the final the final verses of 26. He says, I'm going to pull, uh, you know, a tire down into the pit, into the abyss. So uh, some have, again, are going to make the case that this is a prophetic uh, a destruction of Satan and his kingdom. But again, I do think that's a bit of a stretch. I don't think that the text explicitly says it. You do have uh, chapter 28 right there in the middle. So, I, I mean, I don't want to say there's no argument to say that this is a prophetic destruction of Satan and his kingdom in the future. Um, but I also, uh, I don't think that the scripture explicitly says that. I think it's trying to parallel the king of Tyre and his pride with Satan and his pride, trying to exalt themselves to being God. Yep. I, think, I think that's what the Showing author's that doing. Showing he's a type. I don't. Yeah, he's a typology. It's not. It's not really making a one-to-one -one correlation that this is what God's yeah. doing. I'm gonna yeah, rename and... this position to be the church lady position. Could it be Satan? <laughs> <laughs> Why does it have to be a lady, Miller? That's true. Because it's the church it, lady. Because of the Saturday, Saturday Night Saturday Live sketch? sketch. Oh, uh, the Saturday Night. Okay, okay. Dana you Carvey. You the chauvinist card. I've, I've removed Dana it. Carvey. It's not chauvinism. It's it's Saturday Night Live references. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. So we all disagree with the the church lady view or the spiritual fulfillment view, go, whichever label you nope, like. Church lady. Um, but <laughs> but one way in which it can be helpful is uh, it, at least in kind of thinking in that way and just not like not just what's physically happening, but also what's spiritually happening and the uh, and on the demonic side. One one way that this could be uh, helpful is is specifically the claim in, in chapter 26 where where it seems to describe a total leveling of tire to the point where it will never rise again there there will no longer be a tire okay which doesn't 
seem like it could be true and this could be uh there's no I, way it's I, true I, i've got four tires on my car right now there you go so josh you're so good um but uh <laughs> you know jesus, jesus will say like it, you know he'll talk about tyre and sidon and like these were cities in jesus day and yet it was leveled in alexander the great's day it was kind of leveled in nebuchadnezzar's day and so some people will say well look it, it wasn't leveled beyond anything it 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 uh, still exists, but uh, specifically on the language of uh, 26, I think it, uh, I think it's around verse 4, um, where it talks about how you'll like, be buried in the abyss, the seas, that, that kind of language. Um, here's a comment, uh, here is a commentary on Ezekiel 26, 19 to 21, uh, focusing specifically on this language of like, you'll never be inhabited again, you'll be lost in the depths of the sea. It says tires descent into the underworld uh, describes as tires descent into the underworld in highly figurative language. The island city of Tyre is pictured as submerged beneath the waves of the sea, but these become the waves of the mythological cosmic flood, the waters of chaos, uh, which have engulfed her at last. Similar language is used of Egypt in uh, chapter 31 verses 14 to 18 chapter 32 verses 13 to 32 and Isaiah's taunt song over the king of Babylon also des deserves comparison. The passage gives the impression that the pit, which is identical with Sheol, is the place of no return and utter lostness. There is no hope of resurrection, simply a murky continuing existence along the people of old, among the ruins of the past, a dreadful end indeed. And, uh, and this kind of touches even on, so it goes into sort of spiritual, but also even figurative language to describe what's happening in Tyre. And again, this is not an inerrantists grasping at straws. This is ridiculously common in prophetic language to speak in figurative ways. And so I, I, I think that, um, that that's a, an adequate explanation and maybe even, I would say, the best explanation for the description that Tyre is lost into the heart of the sea and never to be, never to and recover. That, those are verses that it's speaking... What was the language we used before the show? I think prophetic hyperbole was the way that we described it. Yeah, and I think, uh, Michael, you might have said those are in verses 4, and there are some like sea-like languages in verse 4, but that specific commentary was off of verses 19 through 21. Um, I'll make the your city uh, uh, laid waste, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep over you and the great waters cover you, when I'll make you go down uh, to those, uh, I'll make you go down with those who go down to the pit, uh, to the people of old, so forth and so on. That that specific passage, nineteen through twenty one. Um, but yeah, right. no, I I think that uh, that is you, you mentioned in esch your eschatology scrolls, Michael. Uh, if you want to, I mean, this is probably be a great time to. Do you have some comparative verses that give some like biblical smack talk? Because we we see this a lot of the times, like with. Uh, like uh, pre-trip, post-trip guys, the historic pre-mill guys, they'll say that there's a tribulation that's coming on the earth that's never come before and will never come and has never come since or something like that. Uh, uh, will never come after. It, that kind of language is actually used throughout the prophets, and it's just hyperbole. It doesn't actually mean there's never been a tribulation like this before. Um, can can you uh, maybe yeah. not in a literal literal sense? Uh, Right. Well, a number of times in the Exodus, I, I have some verses here, Exodus 9.18, Behold, about this time tomorrow I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never has been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. That sort of formula, uh, such as has never been before uh, until now, or sometimes will never be again. It says the same thing about locusts in Exodus 10.14. Uh, this uh, Exodus 11.6, there shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. Same thing in Joel chapter 2, verse 2. Same idea in Ezekiel 5, 9. Same idea in Daniel uh, Daniel 9, 12. Daniel 12, 1, which is the famous Great Tribulation passage. And then Jesus uses it in Matthew 24, 21 to say, from then on, there will be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world, from now on, no, and never will be. So, uh, so this... You know, if we take it in a purely literalistic sense, then uh, then we would have to understand. Well, uh, there's only there's one great tribulation at the very end of time, and that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. A, a preterist is going to come in, or a partial preterist, I should say, and they'll say, "Well, this is this is hyperbolic language that occurs again and again throughout the scripture, and it just is meant to say this is going to be a really, really crazy bad tribulation." Now. I'm not going to give my position now because I'd, I'd have to defend it and really walk through some stuff. But uh, my, my point is that prophetic hyperbole is a thing. They do use it. And Ezekiel seems to be a case in point of that. 
So is that what you were looking for, Josh? That is exactly what I was looking for. Uh, and, you know, honestly, I I want to just give you, so you complimented me at the top of the show. So I want to compliment you oh, wow. now for oh, the restraint that you just Recordous. gave to not unpack your whole eschatological position 10 minutes before the show's <laughs> over. Because I know you could have it and would did have. did require monologue. restraint. And it I really just, did. I want to, I want to just commend you for not chasing that Thank eschatology you. squirrel dude this is well the best done. show ever we're like patting each other's back and encouraging one another we're actually acting like christians for once what's really <laughs> funny is people don't know that we have a live google doc and we're talking trash to each other in the google doc i know live. i was literally right now trying we're talking I was literally trying to ignore your trash talk while that you were typing at me while I was talking. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was me. <laughs> okay, that was Miller. Okay, now let, guys, let's. Um, so we walked through the different views: the the partial fulfillment view, the different pronouns uh, view, the conditional prophecy view, and the spiritual fulfillment view. Um, In I addition think, to the other two the, that you missed, that he actually missed it. In right. addition to that, right, yeah. that he actually, one, that he missed it, but since it was contained within inerrant scripture, uh, it's a lesson for all of us, and the totality of it is still inerrant, or he missed it and God's a liar, which of course is a lie and hogwash. So right. um, anyway, if I had to pick one, man, I think it'd be a toss-up between partial fulfillment and different pronouns view. I could I could go either way. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the Kairos goes, guys, you talked about uh they they say that the hebrew um doesn't lend itself to the pronouns view and they actually cited the septuagint which i looked up while we were while we were talking and it was accurate the septuagint does not shift pronouns in that so uh maybe a, a very very slight leaning toward the partial fulfillment view but possibly a different pronouns view could also work and to be clear they, they didn't they didn't quote the septuagint i just I, I did the research on that one. So like they didn't actually mention oh. that in their rebuttal. So I don't want to put words in their mouth if it sounded like I said they made the case for the Septuagint. I'm just yeah. saying when I was studying this and people who argue against the pronoun position, they do say like, look, the Septuagint is a great example of why we shouldn't take this is because the Septuagint translators believed that the they was a him. You know, it was still speaking of Nebuchadnezzar. So um, yeah. Yeah, and if you don't know what a Septuagint is, it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So normally we're working from the Hebrew and what's called the Masoretic text. Uh, but often in New Testament times, they'll quote from the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation. And sometimes the reason it's uh, it's helpful to, to know what the Septuagint says is because it helps you understand uh, what the Jew how the Jewish people understood those texts in their own day in the way that they translated. So uh, anyway, but... Neither here nor there. There are lots of great options for inerrantists uh, to believe. Uh, Miller, why don't we bring this back to you, and uh, you can kick us off because I think it's about time to, to close out the episode. Help us understand why this is important on the uh, kind of leaving beside leaving aside the inerrancy conversation. Why is this important from a prophecy perspective, specifically in your understanding about the nature of prophecy and how it works today and in ancient times? Yeah, so it just depends if you want to, like, there's wide disagreement. We've done a lot of videos on this on, already on whether or not uh, there is any difference between Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets, or just the, the gift of prophecy, does it change between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? And I've made the argument in past episodes that, yeah, there was a change, but not in the nature of prophecy, but rather in the frequency of prophecy and who all the who all gets the spirit of prophecy. Um, so when you go to like Deuteronomy 18, um, where it talks about a prophet like me, if he says something, it doesn't come to pass. Don't be afraid of him. Um, there's this sense in which you're supposed to stone a person or kill a person if they get the word wrong. And we've made the argument in the past that in, in Deuteronomy 18, that's spe uh, referring specifically to an eschatological figure that's like Moses. And we would say that, that Jesus is the one who fulfills Deuteronomy 18. Um, now, many other people today, including, uh, well, I mean, you know, Justin Peters and I think some of the others out there that are cessationists would say that, hey, if a prophet gets it wrong, that prophet is supposed to be stoned. And and they'll quote those passages. And we, and we on the show, for the most part, I think, Josh, you're in agreement on this, that Deuteronomy 18 is not referring to just any old prophet. Right. Uh, but, but the reason why this is so important is we actually think there are examples in the Old Testament of prophets getting it wrong. And it's recorded uh, for our sakes so that we would also know that, that prophecy is 
inerrant, the scriptures are not. That there's two different standards for. Yeah, uh, and when you say prophecy is errant, when it comes to prophecy, the prophetic scriptures themselves yeah. being the uh, only one inerrant, and prophets giving a prophecy errant, unless it's recorded right. in scripture. So right, but you but and when you say prophet, yeah, yeah, and when you say prophecies are errant or can be errant, just to clarify for anyone out there. Uh, what you're not saying that the original revelation from God was errant. You're saying that by the time that person actually shares that prophetic word, it can be lost in interpretation and in application somewhere along the way. So it's like when you're driving, going through a drive through and you're know, like, wait, what did they say? <laughs> right. And so it can be lost in translation, so to speak. But Miller, I don't, you're, I know that you're not saying God in his original revelation is errant. We would say he's always inerrant in what he says, but sometimes we miss it. And us missing it, dating all the way back to Old Testament days, does not automatically label one as a false yeah, prophet. Miller for sure exactly what that. I meant. Okay, okay. I was about to say your headphones died. It's what you texted us. So I don't know if you heard that, but that? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no worries. Uh, yeah, so so that's, that's really important to mention uh, that um, when we talk about the prophecy being misunderstood we also believe that prophets can not hear from god at all and think that they're hearing from god and and misspeak on that ground as well uh one of the i, I got to teach uh really odd uh, uh for me but i got to go back to the southwest assemblies of god uh yesterday and i got to preach to like a, a big youth conference there and i got to teach on on prophecy so i got to talk about one of the things we talked about was john uh, chapter 12, where uh, Jesus prays this prayer, hey, Lord, glorify your name. And the Father speaks from heaven. I have glorified it, and I'll glorify it again. And the voice is audible from heaven. And some people said it thundered. Some people said it was an angel. And yet John records it as the voice of God. So not only is it like not the internal audible voice that we typically hear, you know, in the scriptures that we see in the scriptures, you know, the word of the Lord came to Elijah or Elisha, while all these other kings were there, they didn't hear the word, but it came like internally. He received this word. Um, mm -hmm. But this was an audible word. And then the people around misheard and misunderstood the word. So so that's to, to, Mil to Roundtree's point of interpretation. But we also think that today someone can believe that they're hearing from the Lord and it not just be them misinterpreting. They might just not be hearing God at all. Um, that's also a, a possibility within that interpretive Certainly. process. Yeah, and I want to come back to Miller's uh, point about Deuteronomy chapter 18. Uh, and we've given our, our understanding of that. I think that's talking about a national figure. Someone's giving national prophets. I don't think it's talking about every everyday prophets like the uh, few dozen of them that were hidden in a cave by Obadiah in 1 Kings 18. I don't think Deuteronomy 18 means everything they ever said uh, when they prophesied was automatically accurate. I, I think he's giving us, how do you know it's the Messiah? How do you know it's the prophet? And... Um, Deuteronomy 13 is a companion passage to that. Josh, I don't know if you have these verses. It doesn't matter either way. I'm going to read chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. I want to read these, and um, and then I want to read a commentary that makes the point that we're making, the point being that written revelation trumps spontaneous revelation every time. Here's chapter 13, companion to chapter 18. It says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you, etc. And so you shall purge the evil in your midst. So companion passages of chapter 18, uh, both of them deal with, uh, with somebody who, well, in Deuteronomy 18, it's somebody misses a prophecy. And I do believe, even though it says you shall not be afraid of him, I do believe that, uh, or that he shall die. I think he's talking about like, they shall be put to death, chapter 18. Uh, but in chapter 18, it will talk about like, uh, I think around verses 15 and 17, if I remember right, um, that he speaks presumptuously. It's in the context of leading after other gods, this false messianic figure. Now we get to chapter 13 in the companion passage. And this time, instead of missing the prophecy, he actually gets the prophet prophecy right. It comes to pass and he performs signs and wonders to validate it. 
And he's still a false prophet. Why? Because once again, this is how you know what a false prophet is. Uh, you know the false prophet because they're leading you after other gods. Now, here's why that's significant for us. Deuteronomy 13, verses 2 to 6. Um, I actually got this quote from our friend Dawson, who, who does some research for us here on Remnant. Uh, but this comes in a, a commentary on the book of Deuteronomy uh, by uh, Jeffrey Tigay. And uh, here is the quote. I just want to read it to you. Uh, he says, the first case, Deuteronomy 13, is one in which the instigator's proposal is hard to resist because he seems to have divine authority for what he proposes. Uh, you know, every, what he said is right. He performs signs and wonders. Moreover, from verse 6, it appears that he even claims that the proposal comes from the Lord himself, not another God. So he's actually trying to use Yahweh's name. The law puts a rational limit on the authority of prophecy and miracles. It indicates that the prohibition against worshiping other gods is an absolute, an eternally binding principle, and that even prophecies and seemingly miraculous proofs to the contrary are to be disregarded. Keeping in mind that a prophet is God's envoy, uh, it is noteworthy that in Hittite in a Hittite treaty, the suzerain tells his vassal that when he sends him messages, uh, there is a discrep and there is a discrepancy between the written text of a message and the oral version given by his envoy. The written message is authoritative and the envoy is not to be believed. Listen to this. Here in Deuteronomy, the discrepancy is between the written text of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and the oral claims of the false prophet. So this is everything we've been saying. Written revelation always trumps. The scripture always trumps. The cessationist claim that, hey, if you... Uh, if you believe in modern prophecy, then you're endangering the sufficiency of Scripture. You're just out there prophesying Bible-level truths. No, we're not. Old Testament, New Testament, we always weigh it by the Word, to the law, and to the testimony. That is where we go. We go to the Scripture. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, if anyone is a prophet or thinks he is a prophet, let him acknowledge that what I say to him is the Lord's command, Apostolic, uh, the apostolic word, always trumps the prophetic word, and we have the apostolic words preserved for us in Scripture. Guys, uh, prophecy does not endanger the Scripture. No, it is because of what the Scripture says that we pursue prophecy, that we eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gifts of prophecy. So we have it right here in Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18. Guys, it, I don't know. I, I need to get off my, my soapbox, but Miller... Josh, you guys can say something, but I don't know. I felt a little fire in me on that one. Jace. What do you monologue and I just say, yes. Have you ever seen that episode no. of The Office where... These are the uh, Lord's chips. Yeah, when Michael... <laughs> <laughs> Where when uh when uh, uh David Wallace says this this long phrase to Michael or something like that, like he's talking about replacing someone in in corporate, and Michael's response was, "Let God speed you on your quest." <laughs> David Wallace <laughs> says, "Yes." <laughs> it's so Josh, my favorite. Josh, my favorite is when I get fiery and then like you're clearly ready to move to the next point, and you say, "Wonderful." Yeah, that's great. Uh, and moving on. Uh, I like it when you start talking like a lot, and then I just mute you. I'm like, that's enough. <laughs> that's my preferred transition. Oh, man. Okay, guys, here's well, the thing. We're we're at 504. We're going a little bit over today. Uh, do we have any kind of closing thoughts? Do you guys have anything you want to say to wrap up? Because I think then we kind of gave our position. Ezekiel yeah. 4 isn't prophecy that was missed. That being said, I think that we have theological precedent that we can miss prophecy. We've talked about that in other videos. We had a nice little bow tie there at the end uh, of this program. Uh, I think Ezekiel didn't miss it, uh, but I do think that there are ways that we can interpret Ezekiel's prophecy that makes sense of why in chapter 29 he says, hey, uh, Nebuchadnezzar didn't get the spoil of the plunder. Uh, anybody have any closing thoughts that they want to they wanna chat it up before we close everything yeah. out? Uh, sure. There is another continuationist position that holds that, you know what, there's a difference in authority between New Testament and Old Testament prophecy. And these continuationists will hold, you know what, Deuteronomy 18 actually did teach that you can't ever miss a prophecy. But now that God has poured out his spirit on all, uh, on his entire church, and uh, he has, the, there's been a democratization of prophecy, that is, the spirit of prophecy rests upon all of us, and in a sense. And, and so we... Uh, the, the authority is less in the New Testament than the Old Testament. So, 
some continu continuations such as uh, Wayne Grudem make that argument. And, uh, and we've walked through those. Go back and watch the Authority of Prophecy uh, video that we made. And you can, you can watch me do my flip-flop where I made one point there and I made a different point today. But um, anyway, it was actually a fantastic episode. So I encourage you guys to go back and watch that. And hit the subscribe button uh, because also on Tuesdays we have the Kansas City Prophets series. And uh, Jeez, you first don't that. episode... Yeah, first episode released last week, and it's phenomenal. And we talk about a lot of these issues. They just keep coming up. Miller, any closing thoughts for you? Miller, you got anything you want to add? No, yeah. no. Wonderful. Good. I think, yeah, fun episode, I would say. I still want to come down to the uh, – figure out, Josh, more about the phrasing, thus saith the Lord, or the word of the Lord came to me saying, and how yeah. that guarantees that it's not – they're not, not about to give an errant word. No, I think that would be a wonderful uh, show probably for the future. Um, yeah, when it's recorded in Scripture, if it says it's the Word of the Lord, I think it probably is. Um, yeah, I, I'd, be, I'd be thrilled to, to set up a show, and maybe we'll do that in the near future. I know we've talked about doing some shows next week. We're potentially talking about doing uh, a show on idols, uh, like in your home. Those things, can they, can they give you some bad uh, voodoo? We talked about pastors transitioning their churches uh, from uh, you know cessationist church, start you know start moving them, transitioning them into the gifts of the spirit. So I mean, we might even do a public vote. We we'll just t toss it on Facebook and have people yeah. engage on what they want to do. Since we have so many show ideas and only one Wednesday in a week. Uh, so yeah, we'll see what happens. Cool. cool. All, All right. right. God bless you guys. Cool. Have a great Blessings. week. Blessings. Subscribe, or Michael will give you a prophetic word that you won't like. That will be conditional. <laughs> Here's a conditional prophetic word. If you don't subscribe. Like that's a threat that I'll if, give you a if, prophetic word. If you don't subscribe. Five dollars, Michael, if you do it. God, 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 <laughs> Trump will be president.